We left at the recess just after President Trump's 224 tweet attacking the vice president. By this time, the president had been in his dining room for an hour. I want you to just think of what you would have done if you were in his shoes and had the power to end the violence. You would have immediately and forcefully told the rioters to stop and leave. Like, stop and leave. Done. As you heard, that's exactly what his senior staff had been urging him to do. But he resisted, and he kept resisting for another almost two hours. In the meantime, all the president did was post two tweets, one at 2.38 and the other at 3.13. One said, quote, stay peaceful. The other said, quote, remain peaceful. But the president already knew that the mob was attacking the police and had invaded the Capitol. Neither tweet condemned the violence or told the mob to leave the Capitol and disperse. To appreciate how obvious it was that President Trump was not meeting this moment, it's helpful to look at the real-time reactions of his own son, Don Jr., to the first tweet, captured in a series of text messages with Mark Meadows. I'll warn the audience that these messages contain some strong language. As you can see, Don, Jr.'s fir Don Jr. first texted Mr. Meadows at 2.53. He wrote, he's got to condemn this shit ASAP. The Capitol Police tweet is not enough. Mr. Meadows replied, I am pushing it hard. I agree. Don Jr. responded, this is one you go to the mattresses on. They will try to fuck his entire legacy if this on this if it gets worse. Here's what Don Jr. told us he meant by go to the mattresses. At 2.58, when you say that, he need, that Mr. Meadows needs to go to the mattresses on this issue, when you say go to the mattresses, what does that mean? It's just a reference for going all in. I think it's a Godfather reference. Sean Hannity agreed, and he also turned to Mark Meadows for help after the president's second tweet. As you can see, Mr. Hannity texted at 3.31 to say Trump needed to deliver a statement to the nation telling the rioters to leave the Capitol. Mr. Meadows responded that he was, quote, on it. Don Jr. and Sean Hannity were not the only ones who implored Mr. Meadows to get the president to speak to the nation and tell the mob to leave, to go home, go home. Throughout the attack, Mr. Meadows received texts from Republican members of Congress, from current and former Trump administration officials, from media personalities, and from friends. Like President Trump's staff, they knew President Trump had to speak publicly to get the mob to stop. Let's look at just a few of these text messages. Fox News personality Laura Ingram said, the president needs to tell the people in the Capitol to go home. Former Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney urged Mark, he needs to stop this now. Fox News personality Brian Kilmeade said, please get him on TV, destroying everything that you guys have accomplished. When we interviewed White House counsel Pat Cipollone, he told us that he knew the president's two tweets were not enough. Let's listen to what he said. I think the question is, did you believe that the tweets were not anything about your advice to the president? No, I believe more needed to be done. Okay. I believed that a public statement needed to be made. When you talk about uh, others on the staff thinking more should be done or thinking that the president needed to tell people to go home, who, who would you put in that category? Well, I, I would put Pat uh, Philbin, Eric Hirschman, um, overall Mark Meadows, um, Ivanka, once Jared got there, Jared, um, General Kellogg. I'm probably missing some, but those are. Kaylee, I think, was was there, but I don't. Dan Scavino. 
And who on the staff did not want people to leave the Capitol? On the staff? In the White House, how about? I, 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 I can't think of anybody, you know, on that day who didn't want people to get out of the the Capitol once the, you know, particularly once the violence started. No. I mean, What about the president? Yeah. <laughs> she said the staff. So I answered. No, I said in the White House. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I thought you said who else on the staff. Um, I, I, I'm, I can't reveal communications, but obviously I think, you know, Let's pause on that last statement. Although Pat Cipollone is being careful about executive privilege, there really is no ambiguity about what he said. Almost everybody wanted President Trump to instruct the mob to disperse. President Trump refused. To understand how inadequate the president's tweets were, let's examine his 238 tweet in more detail. For context, here's what was happening at that time. Doors barricade. There's people flooded the hallways outside. We have no way out. We were just told that there has been tear gas in the rotunda, and we're being instructed uh, to each of us get a uh, gas masks. We went from a peaceful protest, and this is a very dangerous situation right now, um, that there are, I'm being told, these protesters on the inside are around both chambers, and there is now tear gas inside the Capitol Rotunda. In fact, members oh. locked in the House are being instructed to put on masks. Ms. Matthews, after President Trump's tweet about Vice President Pence, you told us you spoke to, uh, immediately you spoke to Kaylee McEnany. What did you tell her and where did she go afterwards? After the tweet about the vice president, I found Kaylee and told her that I thought the president needed to immediately send out a tweet that condemned the violence that we were seeing and that there needed to be a call to action to tell these people to leave the Capitol. And she agreed and walked over to the Oval dining room to find the president. We, we interviewed Ms. McEnany and others who, who were in the dining room with the president, uh, urging him to put out a statement. Ms. Matthews, Ms. McEnany told us she came right back to the press office after meeting with the president about this particular tweet. What did she tell you about what happened in that dining room? When she got back, she told me that a tweet had been sent out, and I told her that I thought the tweet did not go far enough, that thought there needed to be a call to action and he needed to condemn the violence. And we were in a room full of people, but people weren't paying attention. And so she looked directly at me and in a hushed tone, shared with me that the president did not want to include any sort of mention of peace in that tweet. And that it took some convincing on their part, those who were in the room. And she said that there was a back and forth um, going over different phrases to find something that he was comfortable with. And it wasn't until Ivanka Trump suggested the phrase, stay peaceful, that he finally agreed to include it. The president resisted writing, stay peaceful in a tweet. He told Mark Meadows that the rioters were doing what they should be doing, and the rioters understood they were doing what President Trump wanted them to do. President Trump's message was heard clearly by Stop the Steal organizer, Ali Alexander. At 2.38, he told another organizer, quote, POTUS is not ignorant of what his words would do. Rioters storming the Capitol also heard President Trump's message. In this video, you'll see surveillance footage from the rotunda that shows a group of Oath Keepers 
including Jessica Watkins, who's been charged with seditious conspiracy. You'll hear her walkie-talkie communications with others as they share intelligence and communicate about President Trump's 238 tweet in real time. Again, we warn the audience that this clip also contains strong language. CNN just said that they evacuated all members of Congress into a safety room. There's no safe place in the United States for any of these motherfuckers right now, let me tell you. I hope they understand that we are not joking around. Military Principle 105. Military Principle 105. Cave means grave. Trump just tweeted, please support our Capitol Police. They are on our side. Do not harm them. That's saying a lot by what he didn't say. He didn't say not to do anything to the congressman. <laughs> well, he did not ask him to stand down. He just said, uh, stand by the Capitol Police. They are on our side and they are good people. So uh, it's getting real down there. I got it on TV and it's, um, it's looking pretty friggin' radical to me. CNN said that Trump has egged this on, that he is egging it on and that he is watching the country burn two weeks before he leaves office. He is not leaving office. I don't give a shit what they say. We are in the mezzanine. We are in the main dome right now. We are rocking it. They're throwing grenades. They're freaking shooting people with paintballs, but we're in here. Be safe. Be safe. God bless and Godspeed and keep going. Get it, Jess. Do your shit. This is what we fucking lived up for. Everything we fucking trained for. Look, took over the Capitol. Overran the Capitol. We're in the fucking Capitol, bro. We've now seen how President Trump's supporters reacted to his tweets. Mr. Pottinger, you told us that you consider the tweets sent to this point to be, quote, wholly inadequate given the urgency of the crisis. What, in your view, would have been needed? Yeah, I... <clears throat> It was insufficient. I think what you could count me among those who was uh, hoping to see an unequivocal, strong statement uh, clearing out the Capitol, telling people to stand down, leave, go home. Um, I, I, that, I think that's what we were hoping for. So something a lot more kind of definitive and not ambiguous, because yeah. he has that power over his folks. Ms. Matthews, you told us about a colleague who said during the attack that the president should not condemn the violence. Can you please tell us about how that, about that moment and your reaction? Yes, so a conversation started in the press office after the president sent out those two tweets that I deemed were insufficient. And a colleague suggested that the president shouldn't condemn the violence because they thought it would be, quote, handing a win to the media if he were to condemn his supporters. And I disagreed. I thought that we should condemn the violence and condemn it unequivocally. And I thought that he needed to include a call to action and to tell these people to go home. And um, a debate ensued over it. And I became visibly frustrated. And my colleagues were well aware of that. And I couldn't believe that we were arguing over this in the middle of the West Wing, talking about the politics of a tweet, being concerned with handing the media a win when we had just watched all of that violence unfold at the Capitol. And so I motioned up at the TV and I said, do you think it looks like we're effing winning? Because I don't think it does. And I again reiterated that I thought that the president needed to condemn the violence because it didn't matter if it was coming from the left or the right that you should condemn violence 100% of the time. We've, we've heard this evening how everyone in the president's orbit was pushing him to do more, to tell the mob to leave the Capitol. One of these people, one of those people was Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. He managed to get the president on the phone and told him to call off his supporters. As you will hear, the president refused, and so leader McCarthy reached out uh, for help to Ivanka Trump, who was at the White House, and Jared Kushner, who that afternoon had just arrived back on a flight from the Middle East. So at some point in the afternoon, Mr. Um, McCarthy uh, placed a phone call to uh, Mr. Scavino's desk line, and it was transferred to the president. Is that correct? That's generally what I recall. 
Okay. Were you involved in making that, transferring that call? I, I, yes. Okay. Where was the president at the time that he took that call? He was in the dining room. Would you personally reach out to the president for more support? I've already talked to the president. Um, I called him. Um, I think we need to make a statement, um, make sure that we can calm individuals down. Did Mr. McCarthy indicate that he had been in touch with President Trump? He indicated that uh, he had had some conversation. I don't recall whether it was the, with the president or with somebody at the White House, but I think he he expressed uh, frustration that uh, um, not taking the circumstances as seriously as they should in that moment. You know, I asked Kevin McCarthy, who's the Republican leader, about this, um, and he said he called Donald Trump. He finally got through to Donald Trump, and he said, you have got to get on TV. You've got to get on Twitter. You've got to call these people off. You know what the president said to him? This is as it's happening. He said, well, Kevin, these are my people. You know, these are these are Antifa. And Kevin responded and said, no, they're your people. They literally just came through my office windows, and my staff are running for cover. I mean, they're running for their lives. You need to call them off. And the president's response to Kevin, to me, was chilling. He said, well, Kevin, I guess they're just more upset about the election uh, you know, theft than you are. And that's, you know, you've seen widespread reports of, of Kevin McCarthy and the president having a basically a swearing conversation. That's when the swearing commenced, because the president was basically saying, no, nah, I'm okay with this. Leader McCarthy, the president of the United States has a briefing room, steps from the Oval Office. It is, the cameras are hot 24-7, as you know. Why hasn't he walked down and said that now? I, I, I conveyed to the president what I think is best to do, and I'm hopeful the president will do it. And have you spoken with his chief of staff? I've spoken to the president. I've spoken to other people in there, uh, into the White House as well. Who else reached out to Ms. Trump that you know of that afternoon uh, about the attack on the Capitol? Uh, I believe at one point McCarthy did. Um, uh, saw my, heard my phone ringing, turned the shower off, saw it was leader uh, McCarthy, who I had a good relationship with. Uh, he told me he was getting really ugly over at the Capitol and said, please, you know, anything you could do to help, I would appreciate it. Uh, I don't recall specific asks, just anything you could do. The, again, I got the sense that, you know, they were, they were, you know, they were scared. They, meaning Ms. Leader McCarthy and people on the Hill because of the violence? He, he was scared, yes. Think about that. Leader McCarthy, who was one of the president's strongest supporters, was scared and begging for help. President Trump turned him down. So he tried to call the president's children. Republican House member Mike Gallagher also implored the president to call off the attack. Mr. President, you have got to stop this. You are the only person who can call this off. Call it off. The election is over. Call it off. President-elect Joe Biden also went live on TV to demand that President Trump tell the mob to leave. I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution and demand an end to this siege. There was a desperate scramble for everyone to get President Trump to do anything. All this occurred, and the president still did not act. I yield to my friend from Virginia.